locomotives are some of the most complex freight haulers out there. Each one might as well be a rolling space shuttle when it comes to just how much is going on with their mechanical and electrical systems. With such immense complexity, there's bound to be some amazing engineering that goes along with it. However, all these interesting mechanisms and design features are rarely seen or talked about. So let's change that. Today, we'll be checking out all kinds of stuff, from the guru valve to that weird protrusion on older EMDs, and even the secret electrical room behind the cab of every locomotive. Let's start off with one of the lesser known design features, the summer winter door, which helps a prime mover to run efficiently no matter what time of year it is. I can't say for certain where it is on EMDs, but on GEs, it's located on the engineer's side at the bottom of a large air intake box that sits right between the engine compartment and radiator compartment. During the warmer months, all locomotives have their summer winter door closed, so the prime mover pulls all its air from the outside. But in the winter, the door is locked open. This is done so the prime mover sucks in warm air from the engine compartment in conjunction with cold air from the outside. By taking in this pre-warmed air, the prime mover can operate with greater thermal efficiency, helping the locomotive to run better overall. I think this next design feature will answer a question that many rail fans have asked. What is this protrusion on the side of older EMD engines? Well, it's an air duct for the traction motors. The massive motors that crank a locomotive's wheels can get quite warm with all that electricity flowing through them, and at roughly $20,000 a pop, you really don't want to burn up a traction motor which is why they're kept cool with air, provided by a massive blower that's usually at the back of the locomotive. All this protrusion does is direct air from the blower down under the walkway and into a series of hypo-frame ducts that ultimately terminate at the traction motors. Next up, we have the impressive 3-in-1 alternator generator. A locomotive's main alt-gen is actually two powerhouses wound into one. One set of windings provides power solely for the traction motors, as they use the most electricity out of anything else on the locomotive. And the other set of windings provides power for the rest of the locomotive's electrical systems. Because alt gens can act as motors when electricity is applied to them, they're also used as a starter for the prime mover. This practice is most common on GEs, as EMDs are typically started with compressed air or two massive starter motors. Speaking of prime movers, how about we check out the Guru Valve, which helps keep the engine from being destroyed in freezing temperatures. Locomotives do not use antifreeze like a car does. Instead, they use a solution of water and borate that will freeze if it gets too cold, because all the borate does is prevent corrosion. Since water expands as it freezes, this means an engine with frozen coolant is one that'll probably never run again. Thankfully, the Guru Valve prevents this from happening. Because if the prime mover's temperature gets down to either 35 or 40 degrees, the guru will open and dump all the water, preventing a far more expensive mishap. What's really interesting is that gurus don't need electricity to operate. The way they're designed makes them a mechanical thermometer and automatic valve all in one. Another super interesting feature on these big old engines is how they combat wear on their pistons. After all, a locomotive's prime mover runs far longer and far harder than almost any other engine out there, so they must do everything they can to stay reliable. On GEs, the head of the piston is actually replaceable. There are many reasons why a piston might become damaged. A valve could come out of time, there could be a hot spot somewhere, the piston could have been bad off the shelf, you name it. Regardless, by allowing this surface to be replaceable, you save a ton of time, money, and material, both in the shop and on the road, because you don't have to go through the tedious process of replacing the whole piston. Many EMDs, however, possess something far cooler than a replaceable head, because their pistons are actually free to rotate a full 360 degrees within their cylinders. This is done simply to ensure even wear on all sliding surfaces. And I'm sure it also helps to maintain the cross hatching on the cylinder wall, which is crucial to proper oil retention and dispersal. These rotating pistons sit on top of a piston pin carrier, and below that, there's a groove cut into the piston itself that holds a big snap ring, which keeps everything from coming apart on the combined intake and exhaust stroke. Nothing but the vibratory forces of the engine causes these pistons to spin. The last thing we'll cover about the prime mover is the power assembly, or PA for short. 
This is basically a modular replaceable block and head all in one. Inside, you have the piston, all its valves, coolant and gas passages, the cylinder itself, a spot for the injector, and a valve cover on top. Just like the removable heads on GEs, these were created to save money and time when doing maintenance. They also save the main block from being damaged, because if something really goes wrong in a cylinder, the trauma is usually confined to the PA, which is way easier to replace in an engine block. Moving away from the prime mover, how about we take a look at the aux cab, the secret electrical room behind the cab of every locomotive that is only accessible through a hidden door. This place really ain't meant for people, so it's quite cramped, with a lot of very dangerous bus bars and live exposed electrical surfaces that could easily kill you. To combat this issue and ensure the safety of any electrician in there, there's either an automatic sensor or manual lever at the entrance of every aux cab. These sensors and levers shut off all the locomotive's auxiliary power, so you don't accidentally kill yourself in there. Another feature that helps to keep people working in locomotives safe is, oddly, the windows on the cab. Out on the main line, train crews come across a lot of hazards, from broken equipment to obstructions of the right-of-way, and even people throwing rocks at the train. In order to keep the crews inside safe, locomotive windows, particularly the front-facing ones, are made out of glass so strong that it can withstand impacts from small bullets such as 22s and 9 mils. There are several layers stacked on top of each other, held together with a strong adhesive. It's very similar to auto glass, but tougher. And finally, we take a look at dynamic weight management, a system only used on BNSF GVOs and AC44C4Ms. DWM is super neat, as it allows you to increase tractive effort on command by raising the middle idler wheel ever so slightly. The bar that these two pneumatic cylinders push on is connected to a large cam-like rod, and when that rotates, it raises a massive but very short chain connected to the idler wheel carrier. By raising the idler, you put more weight on the outer wheels, increasing tractive effort. Now, we've barely scratched the surface of what's going on inside a locomotive. I mean, we didn't even touch on plastic-lined glycol lubricated air compressors, which use teflon line cylinders for reduced friction, and glycol instead of oil because it has superior heat dispersion properties and a high boiling point. But never mind that. I hope I was able to help you learn something new today. And if you know of any neat locomotive design features that weren't mentioned in this video, please let us know about them in the comments. Thanks for watching. If y'all enjoyed this video, consider checking out some other ones of mine. Also, maybe pass yourself by the merch shop. Anyways, till next time.